Good afternoon and welcome to today's Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have you with us for today's presentation, which is eligible for one continuing education credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday shirt for answering the following trivia question. Our sponsor, CyberMDX, was announced today as the winner of what Cybersecurity Award? You can answer now using the questions feature on your GoToWebinar dashboard. While you're answering, I'd like to invite everyone to save the date for our upcoming HTM Mixers over the next few months. We'll be in Milwaukee on July 14th and 15th and in Kansas City on September 9th and 10th. Please visit htmmixer.com for details, registration, and our steps to a safe and clean meeting environment. While you're there, please make sure to sign up for our GoToWebinar, I'm sorry, for our newsletter, <laughs> so you will always have the most up-to-date information. All right, the correct answer to our trivia question is Fortress Cybersecurity Award. Thanks to all who have participated. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, CyberMDX. CyberMDX provides a single place to view and prioritize all device groups. They will tell you where to start and what to do with and what to do next. They help you mitigate or remediate by empowering your team to simulate different actions and see the risk reduction impact of each action. This enables faster response and with fewer required hands. They research, track, alert, validate, analyze, and help you comply. You won't need to re-architect your network because they believe it's about layering protection around medical and IoT devices. For more information, please visit cybermdx.com. Our presenter today is Rich DeFabritas, Senior Director of Product Marketing at CyberMDX. Rich, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, Jennifer, and thanks everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for today's webinar, bringing biomed and security together to take control of your medical devices. Okay, I have a screen that popped up in front of me, so just bear with me, I'm gonna to try to minimize it. There we go. Just a little about me, as uh, Jennifer said, my name is Rich DeFabritas, I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing at CyberMDX. Um, I have uh, 25 years of experience in telecommunications and security, and that's actually, I think I said this in the last webinar I did, it's probably a little bit of a, 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 a lie. I actually have about 30 years of experience, which is a nice way of saying I'm, I'm very old. I've been around a long time. Um, I've held various roles within marketing and product management with companies like BA Systems, Sonus Networks, Avaya, Lucent Technologies, amongst others. Uh, and I specialize, and you'll see me or hear me say this throughout the conversation, primarily in network and application security and things like unified communications. Um, and I have a very uh, big affinity for pizza. So if you're a pizza lover and, and you want to, you know, shoot the breeze about pizza, I've been to some of the greatest pizza uh, pizzerias in the country and around the world. Uh, it's like a little passion of mine. But um, I say, you know, security just because I know many of you are probably in the biomedical field. So I'm coming from this, you know, with a more of a security angle and, and hopefully you'll see some of that. A little about CyberMDX and what we do. Um, you heard Jennifer say, mentioned some of the things. I'll just cover a little more here. Our mission is to enable healthcare delivery organizations like yours provide quality care by securing and protecting the systems and devices they rely on every day to treat illnesses and save lives. And we do that through uh, a solution we call our healthcare security suite that provides really a, a kind of a unique approach. And, and again, it's something contextual because we'll talk about this as I get into the presentation, um, is, is less about just a network-based type solution. It is more about uh, you know, layering uh, a layered architecture that puts you know cybersecurity right down on the device level itself. Okay, so remediation and mitigation of of risk is directly on the medical and clinical assets, which is really a more robust solution than than you know more traditional solutions that focus just at the network layer. Um, you heard Jennifer mention that we were just announced as the winner of the Fortress Cybersecurity Awards. We've won numerous awards, that one being the most recent. Have also been cited by analyst firms such as Forrester, Frost and Sullivan as a leader in connected medical device security. 
Um, if you go on to Gartner Peer Insights, uh, you'll see we have amongst the most, if not the most, uh, peer reviews uh, by folks in the industry um, with five-star reviews across the board as a game-changing solution. And again, some of this we, will, will be contextual, and you'll, you'll see and hear about it when I get to the presentation. Some of our clients are Mainline Health, uh, Michigan Medicine, Northwestern Medicine, and we also are very proud of and have uh, a, a research arm, CyberMDX Research, which works closely with medical device manufacturers to uncover or identify major vulnerabilities in their product. And we also work with uh, CISA, organizations like CISA, MITRE, and the FDA. And, and the reason we do that is to drive security and safety you know, to those devices and to help shore up or protect hospital networks, which are incredibly diverse and, and very complex. So uh, over the past couple of years, we've identified 15 major vulnerabilities and worked very closely with those manufacturers uh, to get them rectified. So today what we're gonna talk about is not entirely security focused, although it will, like I said, lean that way. Um, I wanna give sort of a perspective of security uh, you know, in terms of, you know, how you see it in a hospital environment, um, sort of the challenges that security teams, if, if you have them, face, particularly because the networks which, with which they have domain over are very unique, very complicated, and a lot of the solutions that are out there today aren't really designed to, you know, care for those devices. And, and it's sort of a logical intersection when you bring in biomedical engineers, right, or a biomedical team. Um, you, if you're a biomedical engineer or in the biomedical role, have also a very complex, very difficult, very hectic uh, you know, purview, um, but there is sort of this looming requirement, if you're not already there, for security. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then how do we sort of meld or, or you know, take advantage of those intersects and, and make this a repeatable sort of a, you know, ingrained process, which in speaking to, you know, at least one biomedical engineer that I know, um, this is sort of the promise of HTM, right? Healthcare technology management is really about all technology within, within a hospital environment, not just, you know, medical devices, et cetera. And so, you know, it is something that has been sort of talked about, maybe we're not yet there. Okay. so. Let's just take a little bit of a view or a day in the life of a CISO or an IT security person within a hospital environment. Now, again, this would apply to you know a CISO or security people really everywhere, but in a healthcare delivery organization, you heard me say the word if, if they have security teams or if they have CISOs, because you know what we know, and particularly again in, in the hospital realm not many have dedicated security teams. They may have a person or a team that also has responsibility for security. Um, but, you know, we talk to many hospitals and we find, you know, it's really that upper tier in terms of size or scope that have dedicated security teams. Okay. So, um, and again, I'll talk a little bit about this, but if there's ever been a job that's been difficult that, you know, at the C-suite level, it is certainly the CISO job, right? These are people that uh, you know are responsible for protecting a wide range of devices, uh, multiple communication protocols, networks, uh, and it is a very difficult job because a lot of times they they become sort of the no person. When I say no, no, right? They have to say no to a lot of people, and and, and it creates conflict, um, and they sh usually struggle for getting budget. Uh, it happens to be uh, at the C-suite level, the job that has the most quickest or most immediate turnover. I think the average life cycle of a CISO is about a year and a half, which is rather short. I know some CISOs personally, including one that actually left the job completely and went back to being you know, like a security analyst because the stress levels were so high, just couldn't deal with it. Okay, And, and, and we've talked to multiple CISOs at hospitals you know, around the world, and, and it's very similar. It's a very tough job. Um, above and beyond the challenge of the day-to-day -day of being that person that kind of says no or has to be the one who comes in and protects the organization, saying, no, we've got to do X, Y, and Z, their main challenges are 
you know, network complexity and then budget constraints. Okay. So again, we find in the hospital environment, a lot of times the budgets that they get are very minimal. Um, they are, you know, really more from traditional security type solutions, which may not have the coverage that they really need to, to secure the hospital network. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a, there's a lack of security tools designed specifically for things like connected medical devices, which are things that you, if you're in the biomedical field, you're responsible for, you know, the life cycle of those devices. And you know, these are not cheap devices, not necessarily designed for security, et cetera. And then the last challenge, again, specific to the, to the healthcare realm, is the escalating attacks. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but right now there's a target on the back of hospitals and uh, it's not going away anytime soon. Okay, so, so what the CISO is really looking for, and, and again, this will be where we talk about the intersect, is you know, a solution that you know, a la like sort of overlays or leverages the existing investments that they've made. Right. There's some, you know, infrastructure, whether it's vulnerability scanners, whether it's firewalls or anything like that, um, they need to leverage that. They, 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 there is no one size fits all solution that's going to address the cybersecurity needs in a in a hospital environment. It just doesn't exist. Right. And then above and beyond that, they're looking for something that's, you know, really easy to use. It's scalable and provides them sort of that zero trust security model and also gives them the ability to do things like micro segmentation or segmentation of the network, which if you don't know what that is, segmenting a network is basically a way to isolate portions of your network, critical portions of your network and controlling through policy uh, communication to and from those devices, which is, you know, makes things much more secure, but it also happens to be a rather difficult thing to do, you know, without some kind of a solution in place. Now, compounding the problem, okay, and again, this is not just a hospital thing, but, you know, of course, it's sort of magnified in the environment, is the ever-changing landscape in security. Okay, we know things evolve, whether it's technology, whether, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, staff, you know, things change, right? We know this. Okay, if you've been in security, if anyone on the call has secure, been in security, you look back 20 years ago and look at, you know, to today, a lot has changed, right? And and I think you know first and foremost, which comes to mind is um, the the sophistication and the volume and velocity of the threats and breaches against organizations. And if I go down this list here, you know you'll see why that is, right? I mean, threat vectors have changed. It used to be predominantly malware through you know some sort of a phishing attack to today we have sophisticated ransomware where entire networks can be shut down until some kind of a, a Bitcoin or cryptocurrency payment is made to a threat organization or threat actors to release it, right? Which is really pretty sophisticated when you think about it. The types of attacks have moved away from sort of this casting a wide net or we called spray and pray, just send out a bunch of different say emails or put up bogus sites and hope someone hits it, and then the malware will, will take off and propagate through the network, to now where we have very surgical targeted attacks. You, you may have heard of something called social engineering, where uh, hackers will, will mimic or replicate, say, an email from someone that you know, like a, an executive, to get you to click on it, or there are things like watering hole attacks where they create websites that look legitimate, or they actually do it to legitimate websites, and the, the malware or the ransomware is a payload inside, you click on something and, and away it goes, right? Um, and this is you know, particularly relevant to hospitals. So again, I'll talk about this in a little bit. Used to be years ago, the idea was that you can prevent an attack. And I would often tell a story at one of my previous companies, we did a survey of CISOs in both the UK and the United States and one of the questions we asked was, uh, how confident do you feel that you can thwart a cyber attack? In the UK, the, the number of CISOs, about 5% said that they felt confident. But in the US, it was about 40%. And I remember at the time, my UK colleagues saying, wow, the United States really has you know, cyber defense down pat. And I sort of you know, argued, no, that's a false sense of security. And, and it is, okay we went from a model of saying, you know, we can prevent an attack 
we can build a moat around the castle to ultimately realizing you can't stop it. Okay, you're gonna get hacked. I mean, it's, it's probably a matter of you know when, right? As opposed to if, and and that's the mentality you have to take. So when you think about that, then it becomes a, a, a mission of mitigation, right? How quickly can I mitigate, and what's my response to to an attack, and can I thwart a certain percentage of them? And a lot of that then gets down to the technology, right? So 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 technologies of even a few years ago we say invasive, things like vulnerability scanners, things that are really intended for IT devices. <clears throat> well, you all well know that uh, you know a medical device, a very sophisticated medical device, many manufacturers won't allow that. Okay, they, they won't support it. It may violate warranty. And again, I know from a, a biomedical person that I know that told me a story that, that he had actually scanned a device that was on network but not in use and it reset the device. Okay, so so you start to get this picture of, you know, these devices, I mean, these technologies aren't really made for the environment with which we work in. Okay, and, and, and that's not really a good thing. And again, we'll see some of that in a minute. I want to stress something really important, and, and this is the core of what I'm discussing today. Okay, that cybersecurity isn't just a technical issue. It isn't it is not the domain of the CISO alone, okay? When one could make the argument that everybody is really involved, and that argument is a, is a very sound and, and one built in a lot of truth, okay? It's across the organization. Whether you think about it daily or you don't, it's still a responsibility of everybody's. And, and let me dive a little deeper and, and show you really why. And I'm gonna go from the right to the left here, just to throw you a little bit of curve while make sure everyone's awake. First and foremost, it is a huge risk to the financials of the organization, okay? So if you're CFO or you're in accounting, you're thinking about this, right? Um, you may get hit with a ransomware attack and you have to pay a ransom. You may get fines imposed on you for potentially exposing PHI data to threat actors. Uh, you may get sued as a result of the breach and then your reputation is damaged. So there's a reputational risk as well. And many hospitals, obviously in the United States in particular, you know, they need revenue. Well, if people don't come to the hospital, you're not getting any revenue, right? So, so it's a big, big risk there. And it, it's surprising that more at this C-suite level don't see that, but, but it's very important to stress that. It's obviously a threat to data security, okay? So the whole core of HIPAA and making sure that you know, patient data is protected completely under threat. Healthcare data can be stolen and it can be sold on the dark web. And I'll talk a little bit about this on one of the next slides, but understand that for the threat actors here, um, this is a financial gain approach. Okay, so healthcare data, PHI data, typically goes for orders of magnitude more on the dark web than say something like a credit card number and it's very easy to see why, because a credit card number is really easy to change, right? There's there's not a lot of life in a in a in a or a long life cycle in a credit card number, but your social security number, your name, your address, amongst other things, they're not so easy to change, right? So the value there and what they can do with that data, it's worth a lot of money. Okay, so I'll give you a little business case on in one of the next slides. And lastly. You know, and this is where you know, I think from a biomedical point of view, it starts to creep into your purview is that, you know, it's a patient safety imperative, right? That medical devices can stop working, they can malfunction, they can report the wrong data. Um, there's all these things that can happen as a result of malware or ransomware or some kind of breach to a hospital network that threatens, you know, the lives and the safety of patients. Right, and, and, and we've been fortunate that nothing has happened yet, but uh, you know, those days may be coming and, it's, and the threat it continues to grow. Okay, so let's talk about you know, the perfect storm that is in healthcare with respect to cyber attacks. And hopefully some of this is eye-opening to you because again, many of you may be in biomedical, you're very influential uh, and, and these things are important to know. Like I said, everybody in the organization should be responsible in thinking about these things. Okay, if you were to look at total breaches against all verticals, uh, according to the 2021 Horizon Report, 
healthcare was by far the most targeted sector, okay, by an overwhelming amount. And it's very easy, I can explain why that happens, okay. Um, the increase in ransomware attacks up 71%, which is massive. The increase in phishing attacks is up almost 700%, which is really massive, again, an order of magnitude higher. And just in the past years, we know from the pandemic, cyber attacks against hospitals have jumped over 500%. Why? Because maybe you're rolling out telehealth or remote work options for staff and patients. Um, and you know we know that uh, uh, Department of Health and uh, uh, Human Services has you know relaxed imposition of penalties if you're rolling out telehealth options to help with the pandemic. Well, you may be using, or maybe your staff or patients are using, you know, unprotected, you know, commercial grade, off the shelf type uh, infrastructure communication solution. Those are potential breach points, right? To the right. Now, this is again where, if you're in the biomedical field, this, you know, pertains to you. The number, the growth of connected medical devices, and I'm going to throw in their IoT as well. So, IoT and IOMT devices. It is expanding rapidly, massively, right? I mean, you know, there's a lot of value in having devices connected to a network, having d easy access to data and utilization and all these things. With all that good, there's this proposition of, of the bad, of the negative, right? There's are more potential areas to be breached. And then when I talk about the telehealth thing, you know, if, if a patient or staff you know, is at home using a laptop and they're, you know, on Facebook and then they're dialing in or I say dialing in, I'm an old school guy, you know, networking into the hospital, that that's a potential point where, where you know, something can get in on the network and it, and it causes all kinds of havoc. Um, understand, again, as I said, the financial piece of this, let me give you the sort of the business case. Why is this happening? Why is this happening to healthcare? Because obviously hackers aren't just attacking healthcare. Is it, is it, you know, is it, just that they're having more success. Well, it's a little of both, right? They are targeting healthcare organizations and they're having a lot of success because again, the, the, the defenses just aren't there. Um, but I mentioned it's a financial thing, right? So, so one of the more infamous cyber attacks in the past few years, uh, many of you may not have heard of this, but was conducted against uh, the financial services industry, specifically what they call the SWIFT banking network. It was something that is now termed the Bangladesh bank heist. And you can look this up. It's on Wikipedia. And, and I happen to be working for a security organization that you know, helped uncover it. Um, what it was, was a nation state uh, attempted over the course of a holiday weekend to steal a billion dollars in money, uh, which represented you know, a, a pretty good percentage of their GDP. Okay, so I won't mention the state, but uh, you know the, the reasons were clear, right? It was financial gain. They needed money. This is a rogue nation, et cetera. So what they did was they, you know, initiated the attack over an extended holiday weekend against the you know, bank in Bangladesh. Uh, it was uncovered only by accident on a Saturday by somebody working in New York. I think with the Federal Reserve, they saw a typo on one of the requests and they shut it down. Now the nation state was able to get away with the threat actors were able to get away with about $90 million. But again, they were trying to get a billion dollars. Well, I talked about the PHI data getting like orders of magnitude more on dark web. The data sort of changes or it fluctuates, but you can find those records anywhere from like $250 to up to like $1,000, right? Yeah, really, like a credit card number is like a dollar because they're a dime a dozen. And again, they can be changed just like that. So no one's gonna pay for something that they know might possibly be changed. PHI data, not easy to change. Okay, so they're willing to spend a lot of money to get access to that data, again, for, for various reasons that I won't get into. Um, but if I look back in 2020, and one of the more prominent breaches exposed almost 500,000 uh, records to potential uh, breach or being potentially stolen, if they could get a thousand dollars per record, that's five hundred million dollars. Okay, so so you're not talking about something that's you know low level. You're not talking about a kid in the basement. You're talking about nation states or very well funded threat actors, very specifically targeting healthcare 
because of the proliferation of medical devices that are connected, because of the lack of security that's being put in place, because of things like COVID, which is causing, you know, sort of the focus to be away from, you know, the network itself. And that's the reason why it's happening. And it will continue to happen until something significantly changes. Another big piece of this puzzle or why this is becoming a problem is, as I've mentioned, traditional security tools, you know, may not necessarily address what you see in the very diverse ecosystem of a hospital. So I'll go through some of this, you know, it may look like something that you, you are familiar with. Most hospitals will typically have a data center that, you know, archives records and images, et cetera, or communication servers. They have EMRs and they may have medical servers. And that data center is usually going to be reasonably protected, right? Because again, there are tools that do address that. Those are more typical IT type tools. You start to get into the main hospital campus. Now you have hyper-connected medical devices like CT scanners, MRIs, glucometers, infusion pumps, um, you may have things like surveillance cameras or uh, HVAC thermostats, right? These are IoT devices that may be sitting on the network. Typical vulnerability scanner isn't going to even see that. Again, within the last 10 years, high-profile attack against Target stores who, ha who has, you know, very significant security presence and, and capability or posture, um, they were hacked through an HVAC thermostat. Okay, so so those devices aren't necessarily being protected. You may have staff that have tablets. You may have BYOD where people can bring their phones in and allows them easy access to data with when they're on the campus and then they take those devices home with them. Okay, there's nothing that really addresses this. And then you overlay the fact that maybe the security doesn't have the, I mean, the staff doesn't have the security expertise whether that's having a dedicated security team, whether that's, you know, you as a biomedical engineer, or whether it's just somebody working in any department in the hospital. One of the CISOs I had met at a roundtable we did recently told me a story of how one department bought a brand new coffee machine that was uh, connected to the internet. I guess it's connected to the internet to let you know someone know that the coffee grinds are out or something along those lines. And he had to go down to that department and say, basically, you got to take that off the network. You can't leave that on there. There's no way to protect that device. Well, that's somebody that knew it was there. Now take a larger hospital. Nobody knows that they exist. Or the story we hear a lot, again, during the pandemic, a lot of hospitals deployed things like Amazon Alexas, put them in patient rooms to sort of ease them, give them a little more comfort. They don't, they can just talk to the device or maybe they want to call someone. And very proud of that. This is a convenience to the patient, except every single one of those is now a potential point of breach uh, for someone, for a, a malicious actor to get onto the network. So from a CISO's perspective, their heads are absolutely spinning. The word I would use is overwhelmed. And that's, that's right from the mouth of a CISO that I met recently, overwhelming, okay? Now I'm gonna take, just move out beyond the hospital campus. I mentioned the remote workers or telehealth, all those endpoints, all those devices, you know, sitting remotely, they're mostly unmanaged, right? I mean, you know, you can't expect that a patient coming in for telehealth or telemedicine is going to be on a VPN. Some may set that up, but it's not likely, right? Or you may have third-party connections. You have partners you work with to do things like maintenance or, you know, it's outsourced, or maybe you you have a, a, a device manufacturer. Some of these devices, we call that calling home, right? It, it, it calls back to for some update or something like that. Okay, again, another potential point of, of breach. So, so the ecosystem, as you can see here, is really, really diverse. It's above and beyond just the medical devices themselves. It's traditional IT devices, third-party connections, it's remote workers. It really is sort of a, a, a big mess in the sense that there's a lot of things that you gotta be thinking about. I've beaten this a little bit, but I want to repeat it. Traditional security tools just simply don't have the scope to address what it is we're talking about, right? They cannot or typically won't be able to see, right, a connected medical device. If they, if they can even see that, you know, they're not going to give you much, right? 
they weren't really designed for medical devices. They were designed for, as I talked about with the data center, really IT type products. Okay, there's very limited integrations with other tools. So again, as a biomedical engineer, you may be using like a CNMS. These vulnerability scanners don't talk to those. They don't really interoperate with them. Nothing like that at all, right? Um, in terms of visibility, you know, it's just as bad, right? I mean, how can you protect something if you don't know that it exists? And I want you to remember that, you know, question, right? Because the same thing applies. How do you perform a job, uh, you know, of, of managing the lifecycle equipment if you don't know where it is, you don't know that it exists, you don't, these stories are true stories. These aren't stories that I'm, I don't have the experience in that realm. These are stories I've talked to other biomedical people that have told me. Um, these traditional security tools are not going to see the devices. They're going to give very limited contextual data. They're not going to know things like, you know, maybe the manufacturer, what the rev of the firmware is, uh, you know, are there FDA recalls? They're not going to decipher proprietary protocols. Okay, so so you have this big blind spot sitting in a hospital environment that a traditional security tool isn't going to address. Okay, so just to step back now. Let's see where the intersection occurs here. And hopefully some of the things that I've talked about, you know, your ears are perking up. You're hearing things that I'm saying that, yeah, you know, that seems kind of relevant to what I do. Okay, and I'm gonna focus particularly in one area, right? Cause I don't wanna minimize what it is that biomedical engineers do. Okay, typically managing, you know, a large number of connected medical devices uh, that's in complete life cycle management, whether it's retiring a piece of equipment, ac acquiring a new piece of equipment, uh, making sure patches are done when they need to be done, tracking the devices, et cetera, right? It's a really important piece of the operations within a hospital, you know, critical, I would say. Why I said earlier that, you know, the biomedical folks are, are very are very influential from a, from a security perspective because, this is this is the blind spot, right? You you are the people that are basically in charge of this. And we talk about being overwhelmed, the CISO with all the different devices. Our stats, you know, probably warrants you know looking into this again because as the proliferation of the devices continues, the number would be expected to grow. Um, we we say the average hospital has right twenty to thirty thousand connected devices. You know, those aren't all connected medical devices, so it's a subset of that, but still quite a bit, right? Maybe 10 to 15,000 are medical devices. And the average biomedical engineer is responsible for about 1,500 to 2,000 devices, which is just insane. It's a huge number of devices that you've got to manage the life cycle of. So, so challenges, you know, from your perspective are time, right? You know, do I have time to manage all these ass assets? Do I have the resources to adequately manage these assets? You know, when I say resource, uh, you know, maybe you're not outsourcing this, or maybe you are still doing things, you know, very manually. And I say still, a lot of hospitals are doing this manually, particularly after something like a cyber attack, where things get shut down, then they're most certainly doing it manually, right? That's a very difficult, if at best, way of doing things. Um, you may not be getting enough contextual information for each asset. So this, this is where I'll say technology, such as like a CMMS, very helpful, but it may not give you the depth of knowledge you really need to know. So when we start getting into things like utilization or managing uh, uh, downtime, when you have to patch a piece of equipment, do you know where that device is? Do you know, you know when peak usage is? Do you know when it's not being used, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then like the part that I'm really gonna talk about is, you know, as of now, security may not have been a priority. And, and it would be hard to expect, you know, a biomedical engineer to be thinking about security the same way that the CISO is thinking about security. But it's important just given the piece that I've talked about already, right? So, so what a biomedical engineer would be looking for, and again, there's some overlap and intersection here with the CISO, things like inventory management, finding those devices quickly, making sure you have critical data, making sure you know if there's any recalls or vulnerabilities on those devices, where are they located? Everyone's heard stories. I've certainly heard them. You know, here's a device we didn't even know was tucked in a back room somewhere and it's sitting on a network and blah, 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 blah. If you don't know where it, where it is, it's very hard to protect that. 
right? I talked about utilization and efficiency, about things like making sure you can patch devices. What about in like an M&A type of environment where you may be joining a larger network or you may be acquiring smaller hospital and there's, you know, overlap or, you know, redundancy in the equipment. How do you know what to keep? How do you know what to retire? You know, those are things you want to be thinking about. And then, of course, you know, things like lowering the total cost of ownership and, and, and maintenance costs, right? If, if, if you could streamline maintenance or if you can simplify the maintenance of the devices or the life cycle management of the devices, that's going to help you, right? That's going to make things, you know, a lot easier. So if I were to look at the you know, typical biomedical team, um, you know, again, responsible for a, a lot of different things, right? The things sort of come to mind to me, again, I'm more of a simpleton with this, are things like, you know, the devices themselves, testing, calibrating, making sure everything's working properly, making sure things are reporting right, making sure technicians are trained on how to use the device and educating people on how to use devices, making sure you're following manufacturing guidelines. These are all really, really important things, right? We talk about reporting metrics, obviously very, very important, status updates of the devices themselves. Um, but as I jump all the way to the right, say like really you are more than equipment maintenance. You're really an integrated part of the facility, an integrated part of the team. And, and we have to start thinking a little more globally. But before we do that, I do wanna stay down and drill down one more and, I, and I'll talk why. What are reasonable expectations of any biomedical department, right? And 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 your feet may be in both sandboxes here, right? It's it's not a bifurcated view of the world. Times may feel like things are reactive, but there may be many things that you do proactively. Okay, but if I just were to look at you know the different realms here, you know what's optimized and what isn't, right? You know, reactive is not where you want to be. Sometimes we accept. You have to be, but it's not always where you want to be. The reason why you don't want to be there is, again, if you're if you're highly reactive, you generally we're not going to have visibility into devices. You're going to miss inventory. You may not know what you have, everything you have. You may have incomplete service records. There may be things with audits, right, and risk assessments that you have to you have to cover. It would be very difficult to do. Again, I had the opportunity to speak with a biomedical engineer at a very large hospital. And I have to give this, this guy a lot of credit. He was very honest and frank with me and said, we do what we can. And this was talking about in terms of compliance. We do what we can uh, to make sure the most critical pieces are in place, but we can't get to everything, right? That's a reactive mode, right? When you wanna be you know, much more proactive if you can possibly be, and that's, it. that's where everything is optimized. You know where everything is in real time. You're able to standardize metrics and reporting. You're able to prepare for things like audits. You're able to conduct risk assessments. And where I'm gonna focus is you know, the asset management piece, right? So if I think about complete asset management, and there's one thing here I'm gonna say is probably missing. Uh, you know, what we're talking about is acquiring or sourcing devices making sure those devices have gone through safety and electrical inspections, Make, making sure that preventative maintenance and repairs or updates or patches are done, um, any third party management you have to do, um, total cost of ownership, as I mentioned. What's missing, I say missing, again, this is not everybody, it's not a blanket statement, because again, I've seen both sides of it. Somewhere in that acquiring the devices and inventory management and preventative maintenance is some sort of a risk assessment, <clears throat> pre-sourcing risk assessment and ongoing risk assessment. What are biomedical teams doing or how are they collaborating with security teams and security teams collaborating with biomedical teams to ensure that you don't go out and procure a device put it in the network and the security team doesn't know it exists or finds out about it after the fact. It's a critical piece of equipment. And right now it's completely exposed. That's a problem. And a lot of teams and hospitals are seeing this. So much so that uh, you know one recent CISO that I met um, was sort of surprised, although I wasn't, um, 
was surprised that the whole biomedical team was put under him. Um, and as I mentioned, having spoken to another, a different person, different place, biomedical engineer said the promise of HTM was that, right? Was this sort of holistic view of technology lifecycle management, of healthcare technology management. It would include that. So it makes a lot more sense then that the biomedical engineers were put under this CISO. And, and he got it, you know, he understood it. He just was surprised by the move, right? I mean, you start to see more and more of that, but that's not the norm, okay? So we're still in a situation where we see, you know, they're operating independently of each other and that can create problems. So I wanna talk about why this matters to you, right? And a lot of it I said, this is the intersect, right? Um, COVID came out of left field, it impacted everybody. Nobody expected something like this would happen. Now we're better prepared to think, okay, this could happen again, um, but rolling out telehealth services, for example, or facilitating remote work for staff so they didn't get in contact, come in contact with people and put them in, at risk, um, has increased the need for connected devices, right? You know, and that, that may not just be uh, in the IT realm. Right, so so connected devices are increasing. You have this demand for a certain type of service. Um, that's important for you to know and be aware of. Um, IoT, as I talked about, IoT may be sort of like what I call corporate IoT, which is like the HVAC thermostats or surveillance cameras, things that you may not necessarily be responsible for. But then you start to get into things again, like more mundane or or consumer grade devices like the Alexas coffee machines and 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 that's crazy right when you sit and think about it i always tell the story i just bought a new refrigerator it has no screen on it just but it has the ability to connect to the network i'm not really sure why but it does okay so you know these are things that you may not even be aware of that have to be cared for i'm talking a lot about staff involvement right i'm talking about you know not just installing or procuring devices, systems, protecting them, et cetera, right? All of the staff needs training and education. You know, everybody needs to know why it's important. Security is an important thing for the hospital. Be educated on the things to look for. Processes need to be put in place. This is before you even get to thinking about solutions, right? They're just things you can do and you have to be doing to ensure that the, the facility remains safe, okay? What happens when critical devices go down? What happens when they're impacted by maybe not even something like a ransomware attack? What's the impact to, to, to patient care? And then lastly, why all this matters is regulatory compliance, things like patient trust, which I talked about, the financial risk, resource allocation. It's all these things. How do you operate that you know, efficiently and cleanly? And, and really that, you know, as I like to say, sort of takes a village, right? It's not you and me, it's us. It's, it may be two departments or multiple departments. If I throw, you know, IT, security, biomedical, et cetera, everybody contributes. It's, it, it's one team, okay? Where the IT or security people may be responsible for things like network maintenance and protection. Biomedical teams are responsible for the physical device maintenance and protection, I will say right? Service and all that, okay? There's the intersect, there's the overlap. It makes logical sense then that we're collaborating and talking with our security teams and our security teams are talking to our biomedical teams, right? And, and there's really three areas, you know, you can focus on that will sort of improve the security posture of the organization. The first is assessing those devices. What do you have? Where are they? Are they compliant? Are they registered with IT? Did you buy something that they don't know about? You know, those are things that are very important. Once you know what it is that you have, once you know whether or not they're in compliance, um, you're going to start to look at and identify and standardize policy. Okay, when I say policy, what are your critical devices? Do they need to be more secure? How do we reduce our risk exposure here? As I said, I spoke to somebody, you know, that was working in biomedical and talking about compliance issues, saying it was best effort. That's not necessarily a bad thing because you're certainly going to want to 
secure life-saving devices or certain parts of your network over others, right? That's not to say that we should be ignoring things like the Amazon Alexa installed in a room, but it's certainly not gonna cause patient harm if an Alexa goes down versus say if an infusion pump goes down. And those are things you have to be looking at and on an ongoing basis, right? So that's when I say create synergy, creating sort of a communication process between the departments, outlining who owns what, and then integrating all of that data, if there's a way to pull that together in a single dashboard, a single report, or a single solution, that makes things very efficient, okay? But, but should no longer really be thinking about this you know, in a bifurcated way. It should be done with synergy and collaboration. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about you know, what that solution looks like, right? I referred to earlier passive scanning technologies versus you know, uh, uh, active scanning technologies. But, but, but I don't even wanna talk about security technologies. I wanna talk about HTM technologies, right? We're talking about complete technology lifecycle management here. What does that look like? Okay, and I'm nothing if not repetitive. My wife reminds me of this all the time, right? Asset inventory and tracking. You really need very high level of detail and accuracy of your devices, okay? And I keep saying like where it is, what it is, what's the manufacturer, what's the model number, what's the serial number, what's the MAC address, what's the firmware rev, what's the OS rev? Uh, are there known vulnerabilities? Are there FDA recalls? When is it being used? Can I patch this device? You know, how many years has it been in service? All of these things you're gonna wanna know with that you're probably doing some of this today, um, but you're doing it, you know, maybe isolated from a security team because the security team also wants to know these things, right? There's, a, again, the intersect, okay? So you wanna be able to, you know, not just identify and classify, but monitor these devices, analyze and track them. The next thing you wanna consider are things like risk assessments. Okay, again, this is something that applies to both the biomedical engineer and the security person, probably the network person too. Uh, you certainly need to know whether or not there are any known vulnerabilities against devices in your network, okay? Um, if you follow or look at, you know, CISA uh, and see they put out uh, uh, ICS advisories, you'll find that you know, many medical devices have some sort of vulnerability that allows potential exploitation by a threat actor. It's not isolated to medical devices. Um, you know, very commonly in something like a Windows environment, if there's some kind of a Windows server, you know, we talk a lot about open RDP or SMB ports. Those are like known ways or backdoors in that most people don't even think about. You know, they buy the server, they put it in the network, and they don't even know that the, that the already pre-port is open. So if some malicious actor gets access to the network somehow, um, they can run roughshod over it. And that was like the wanna cry situation that happened a couple of years ago. Okay, so you're gonna wanna know what vulnerabilities you have and you wanna score, you know, identify, score them and prioritize. So score, I mean CVSS, okay? So if you're not familiar, CVSS score, it, it talks to, uh, you know, how critical or how serious or severe that vulnerability is. Is it easy to exploit? If it is exploited, what, what kind of potential damage can it do, et cetera, okay? And then prioritize. These are critical devices for us. We need to fix this. We need to remediate this. How do we remediate it? Are there patches? Are there advisories from the manufacturer that we need to follow up with them so I can make sure the device is secure? You're gonna wanna do that, right? You're gonna wanna be able to mitigate and prevent through policy any further issues with the devices once you've remediated it, right? So once you know that everything's been updated and everything's cool, do you put policies in place like block lists, white lists, antivirus? I talked about segmentation. Depending on the criticality of the device, you may wanna segment it from the rest of the network. These are issues or things that both the biomedical department and an IT or security department will be thinking about. That now I'm getting into sort of ongoing management, right? At first, we're, we're taking a look and assessing, we're taking steps to remediate. Now you're, you're in a somewhat optimal state, but remember I talked earlier, so I'll make a little bit of a connection here about how things evolve, right? 
well, things will evolve. You can't just assume that once you've gotten to a, a, a you know a stabilized state, it'll stay there, right? It, it, it's going to change. So detection and response is very important. Do you know if there's been a breach on the network, right? And how do you respond to a breach on the network? Um, and then by this, we're talking about detecting any strange behavior with a device or the network, making sure that uh, a SIM or some other type of monitoring you have gets notification and sends out alerts. You can then scope or assess the impact and isolate devices and then your response, whether that's done automatically, whether it's manually integrated with you know, other devices on the network like firewalls for policy, et cetera. But you wanna be thinking about these things. You wanna look for this in the solution that you have and, I, and I'm passionate about this, okay, because I, I actually wrote a white paper on something called incident response, okay, and, and what you see in hospitals in particular, you see it over in Ireland with Conti. If you haven't read about that, very interesting to read. It's about three, three to four weeks ago, there was a ransomware attack, and the response was to shut everything down. Now, the reason they do that is containment, okay? There's hardly a better way to contain shutting everything down. Unfortunately, when you're running a hospital, that may not be the best solution for a patient. And they've been informed as of this date still that uh, care will be delayed, appointments will be pushed out or rescheduled. You know, is that the proper response? Or do you have a solution in place that tells you, isolates where things are happening and, and gives you the ability with clicks to isolate the device and say, okay, it's now protected, it's segmented, or it's been, and we can take it offline physically. So you've been thinking about things like that. And then also, again, now we're really into the ongoing piece of it is compliance and governance. Compliance is a very complex thing. If you, if you are involved in that, you know, okay? Uh, HIPAA regulations are pretty significant. You may wanna know whether a device, if it has things like PHI data on it, is it compliant? Are there areas that we can shore up? Can we do that in an automated way? Um, or do we have to do this in a very manual, tedious way? No, you wanna be able to do things like click and figure out, okay, these devices are not in compliance with HIPAA, you know, regulation one, two, three, four, I'm making this up, right? And then prioritize which ones need to be brought into compliance and go from there, okay? So, so these are things you wanna be thinking about. And, and, and to just sum it up, right, is ultimately a single source of, source of truth that, you know, breaks down the silos that have traditionally existed within hospitals. We're no longer living in, you know, what we had in the past, right, where we could sort of just peacefully coexist without overlapping or interfacing with one another. Um, you only need to look at any of the healthcare publications today or go to Google and publish, I'm sorry, type, uh, uh, you know, hospital cyber attack, and you'll be, you know, served up with a ton of stories. It, it, it's very scary. It's something we all have to take very seriously. And it's something that, uh, that you know, everybody in the organization needs to push and influence and drive together. Okay, so, so ultimately the solution you're looking for should be a complete HTM type solution not a biomedical solution, not a security solution, not a networking solution, but one that really provides bespoke or customized access and reporting and capability for your respective functional roles. And with that, I wanna say, wow, I, I usually go over. Thank you for the time. I actually made it in just under, what do I have four minutes left, Jennifer. Um, any questions? Thank you so much, Rich. That was great. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in for you. Uh, a reminder to our audience, if you do have any questions, we only have a few minutes left today, but I can get those questions to Rich after the webinar. So if you'd like to submit any, please do that now. Our first question is, do you think cybersecurity teams and biomedical teams are collaborating on lifecycle management 
and what equipment to uh, you know to procure or to obtain yeah okay so i kind of talk a little bit about that during the presentation and what i would say is i'm encouraged to see that it's happening more i think this is happening you know out of necessity i think if hospitals are uh, dedicated to the security side of things you will certainly see it now now i'm going to ramble a little bit and i don't want to make the answer too long but recall that i had mentioned early on that if you were to look at you know there's like 6200 hospitals in the united states roughly you know maybe 300 have a dedicated security team okay so so like the first thing that has to happen is the c-suite or the executives have to take cybersecurity very seriously they have to invest in it they have to make sure that you know that the, the, there's there's backing for those teams and then when when they do have that um then the, i think the biomedical teams and security teams can can collaborate a lot better what's more likely you'll see uh is it's like a ad hoc security team that doesn't really have the backing of the of the you know management and things are a little bit loose but but i'm encouraged to say that it's changing but maybe not fast enough All right, our next question is, it's a long one, so hopefully we, we won't go too far over. Um, as an HTM at public sector in Los Angeles County, our HTL role is very limited. This means we cannot get involved, uh, we cannot get involved in network configuration and management and very little incoming inspection for new coming devices. How are other hospitals um, cooperating with IT to make it work or to minimize the gap between HTM and IT? So I'm not sure I'm, I'm entirely answering it properly, but you know, uh, I think I think the the big thing is if there's uh, a requirement for equipment. Um, you know, you you absolutely have to be in contact with networking or IT people. Um, and the thing that I see a lot is, you know, perhaps working together on like questionnaires or you know some sort of assessment that can be done prior to any procurement, right? So like. I don't know if the, the networking people would be the gatekeepers necessarily. Um, they could be. Um, but if you satisfy a requirement and you've done everything you can do up front, then it shouldn't be an issue, so, assuming the need is there. Um, but but that to me is sort of the first and foremost. And to be honest with you, again, you're not seeing a lot of that. We're not seeing, you know, you know really the push for it. It happens, right? I'm not saying it's non-existent, but um would like to see more of that more you know institutionalized where there's a process by which has been defined you know say networking or security team say if you're going to go procure this equipment this is what you need to do it needs to be approved obviously buying a very expensive piece of you know a medical device isn't a trivial thing um so i know it takes time but if you can sort of check those boxes beforehand it should satisfy the need. And, and I think, you know, the one thing that security and IT people have to be very careful of is they're not blocking, you know, that process either, right? Because if there's a legitimate need for something um, and you're holding it up, you're, you're putting still patients sort of at risk, right? So you don't want to do that. Thank you so much, Rich, for a great presentation and an informative webinar. Thank you to our sponsor, CyberMDX, to receive continuing education credit for today's webinar, please look for an email from us one hour after we end today. The email will, will contain a survey link. Once you have completed the survey, you'll be able to download your certificate immediately. If you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. For more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website webinarwednesday.live. Thank you again to Rich and to CyberMDX. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you.